ओम गणपत नम 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 chanting twice let's start we'll do it together we can do it together om bhadram karne bhi shrunu yam devah bhadram pashye maksha bhirya jatrah स्थिरंगुष्टुवागम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्वेदा स्वस्ति न स्ताक्ष्यो हरिष्ठनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा शांति 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 ओम नमस्ते गणपत प्रत्यक्ष कवल कर्ता कवल धर्ता कवल हर्ता खलिद ब्रह्मासी साक्षात्मा निमी सत्यम वच्मी हवक्ता हवश्रोता हवदाता अवधाता अवाचानमशिष्य अवपश्चाता पाहि पाहि समंता चिन्मय ंदमस्व ब्रह्मय सच्चिदनंदीयूसी प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्मासी ज्ञानमयो विज्ञानमयूसी सर्व जगदीदो जायते सर्व जगदीदिषति सर्व जगदीदेश्यति जगदीदी प्रत्येति भूमिरापो नलो नीलो नव चारी वाक्पदानी मूलाधारस्थिसी निशक्तिमक योगिनो ध्यास्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस्व्रस
गकार पूर्व रूपम हकारो मध्यम रूपम अनुस्वार्चांत्य रूपम बिंदुरुत्तर रूपम नाद संधानम सगुम हिता संधि ही सई शागणेश विद्या गणकरिषि ही निच्छ्रत गायत्री चंदह गणपतिर देवता ओम गंग गणपतये नमः एकदंताय विद्महे वक्रतुंडाय धीमहि तन्नो दंते प्रचोदयात् एकदंतम् चतुर्हस्तम् पाशमंकुशधारिनम् रदम् च वरदम् हस्तेर विब्रानम् मूषकद्वजम् रक्तम् लंबोदरम् शूरपकर्णकम् रक्तवाससम् रक्तगंधानुलिप्तांगम् रक्तपुष्पै सुपुजितम् भक्तानुकंपिनम् देवम् जगत् कारणमच्छुतम् आविर्भूतम् च सृष्ट्यादो प्रकृते पुरुषात् परम् एवं ध्यायति यो नित्यम् सायोगी योगी नाम वरह नमो व्रातपतये नमो गणपतये नमो प्रमतपतये नमस्ते स्तुलंबोदराये कदंताय मिग्नाशीने शिवसुताय श्री वरदमूर्ताये नमः ॐ शांति 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 ही So we read this verse yesterday. Tvam mula dharos dito sinityam. The flavor of the text slightly changes. The highly subtle matter was given in, I think, the first six verses and then introduces a new train of thought here because the mula dhara is referring to um, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras where they describe the body as having chakras and at the base of the spine a kundalini energy which is described I guess more um, meta metaphysically as a snake but basically what it is is latent energy of infinite potential and then through this kundalini yoga techniques you awaken it and it's described to coil up through the spine opening each of the chakras as it does until it reaches <coughs> the base of our head the crown chakra at which point enlightenment is reached so kundalini yoga can be extremely popular because people love to think of themselves as progressing 
And here there's a, a base chakra, then you can move up, and you can move up, and so it's, you know, you feel like now I'm in stage four, now I'm in stage six, and now just next week I'll get to enlightenment. And so we like to feel that very, very structured sense of progress. But spirituality is such an incredibly subjective thing that to measure progress is not so easy and not, it can't be graded in quite the same way as school does. Also, people love it because there's, it's associated with the body. These chakras are all based along the spine in our body. And I'm not going to go into it much because when Gurudev asked our Swami Tapanji Maharaj, Gurudev was up in the Himalayas, and people talk about this, and it can be quite mystic, and it can be quite esoteric, because if you open this chakra, then you get that energy, and if you open this chakra, then you get this siddhi, and if you can do this. And so it can be all very wow and intriguing. So Gurudev went to Swami Tapanji Maharaj and said, you never taught me this. You didn't teach me kundalini yoga. I mean, everybody else is talking about it, and I don't know what it is. And Swami Tapanji Maharaj answered in one sentence, I don't have a kundalini. And that was the end of the discussion. When we think of enlightenment, and if we associate it with an energy, then remember, energy is still matter. And then we've still objectified Brahman. And to think we can control Brahman and manipulate it so that we can reach this state is already misunderstanding. Upanishads start with you are Brahman, already now reached. And if you're thinking, no, that's just our inability to see the truth right in this moment in time. <coughs> and so from a purely Advaitic Vedantic point of view, since it cannot be objectified, it's not a source of energy sitting in the base of your spine. Another reason possibly Tapanji Maharaj discouraged it so quickly is that we still focused on the body. And already to get rid of body identification is so extremely difficult. There was this incident where Gurudev was telling our Guruji. It was a, must have been a really cold day, and you know we'll automatically... Uh, snug up in our jackets and people have now even these hand warmers that you hold on to. Mm. Now up in the Himalayas, cold is an understatement. Mm. Swami Tapanji Maharaj, and if you see any picture, did not wear more than that kurta. No jacket, no scarf, no gloves, no. And then when the other sannyasis, because if you go high enough, there's nobody else living there. There's only sannyasis and renunciates living there. At night especially, we'll build a bonfire just to keep warm. Now, we wouldn't think of this as anything wrong or anything indulgent at all. It's cold, they build a fire to keep warm. They invite Tapanji Maharaj to come and sit with them at the fire. So they've already built it. He doesn't have to. You just come and sit so you can also be a warm for a little while. Because they invited him, he would sit for maybe two minutes. So not to reject their invitation. And then he'd walk away. And he'd tell Gurudev, this is sense pleasure. That much awareness of how identified we are with our body. We would never think of staying warm when it's cold outside as sense pleasure. And that's not, he, didn't, he didn't even also mean that we're that indulgent. He just meant no need to be so pampering to body. 
Now, if I'm going to be focusing on the kundalini rising up to this point and then to this point and then to this point, those are all points in the body and it's just increasing my preoccupation with body rather than letting it, letting me be able to disidentify with it. So, thvam mula dharo stitosi nityam is referring to this latent energy that is there on the base, the first, the, the first chakra. <coughs> Because in the beginning, everything is there. But here, um, all we need to know is whatever that energy force is, is Brahman itself. <clears throat> or rather than energy is Brahman, that in the same way as this whole world is Brahman, in the same way as every thought is Brahman, in the same way that nothing else but Brahman exists, whatever people are talking about as that Kundalini force, that's also nothing but Brahman. But remember, it's not here saying that it's infinite, immutable, eternal, here when we, we're still giving it some kind of shape because energy still has a sense our mind can think about it. We can think far more easily about energy than we can think about eternal. But if our mind is thinking at that level, then know that that then energy is also Brahman. Upanishads always start at the very, very highest. And then the teacher will look around and see, oh, we didn't quite get it. Okay, slightly temper it down. And so already here that's happening. And to explain this energy further, it says, Thwam's of energy. At the level of Upanishad, we've already, the student has already been studying on a regular basis and very familiar with all these terms. So Upanishad, the guru, guru says it, student says yes. But sometimes if we've not had that much exposure, then it has to be broken down. Although when I do, a lot of you who have been studying will immediately nod. Maya, because when we're talking about Shakti, then we're not talking about essence of just life without any kind of movement. We're talking about now the expression of it has Avarna Shakti, which is the Vikshepana Shakti, which is the projecting power of Maya. In Vikshepa Shakti, <coughs> it works in three ways. Gurudev, Guruji, sorry, has given it in his commentary, but extremely briefly. It, the three types is our force, our ability to be able to accomplish anything, the power by which we are driven can be broken down in these ways. Ikcha Shakti is the power of desire. When we have desire, we will do it. Even the most timid person, when they get a desire, they will accomplish it. And I think an example of this, which I have found that really shows it so well, a tiny baby, when they don't want to be carried by you, They're so small, huh? We're so much bigger than them. We're so much stronger than them. We could squish them if we wanted to. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't. Hmm. But if that baby doesn't want to be carried, you can't. Icha Shakti. Desire gives us such strength. And it doesn't matter what the desire is. When we have it, we, we become a force. When you fight with someone who wants something and you're not giving it to them, you see the force that they become. Icha shakti, jnana shakti. Jnana is knowledge. 
This is not the same kind of force. It's far more subtle, but it's, it's far more profound and transformative. When we understand something, when we get it, we change. Not intellectually, but when we really get it, like when we see it for ourselves. Somebody else might be telling us that, you know, you have this habit and it's not helping. And then suddenly one day I see it for myself that, oh, I'm self-sabotaging. I change. When I see it for myself that maybe I'm using a particular word too often and it's distracting in my speech, or a sly, or a profanity, I become aware of it. We change. When I just got posted to Hong Kong, I was with the youth and we, were, we had gone for a walk. And at the end of the walk, I remember looking at this girl and I said, do you know you swore about 12 times? She was horrified. Because of course she didn't intend to. But you know when they're in that very young age group, it's almost second like nature to them. And I think um, she was traveling for a while and she came back after two months and I spent another hour with her and then at the end when she was leaving, she's like, I didn't swear. Knowledge will change us. And so it's power, shakti. And the last one is kriya shakti. Today it's misunderstood to be a yogic phenomenon. But kriya just means movement. And so my acting is shakti. Super simple example. You've been waking up earlier to come for these morning talks. Or it might be your routine, but for some people who are waking up earlier to make it to come for these talks, Saturday morning chances are you're going to wake up early. Because the action creates momentum. Shakti. Action creates some kind of force within us. Also, force is needed to do the action, but here it's the force created by the movement. Even our own breath, when we manipulate how we move it, it can create a lot of energy within us. It can create heat within us. Right? So uh, one of the translations of the pranayamas is breath of fire, <coughs> because it can generate heat, which is a sign of energy. All of this when we get preoccupied with it. We must remember, it. this shakti is nothing but Brahman, now manifesting and taking this kind of a form. Even though it's not a tangible, tangible as my hand or the carpet, it's still something we can conceive. Energy is still something we can conceive. And so when we get fascinated by it, this is also nothing but Brahman. It's another way to also see our ingredients. We started with seeing our ingredients as space, air, fire, water, earth, and not my hands. This is just space, air, fire, water, earth. To see my thoughts as space, air, fire, water, earth, it may be a little bit too subtle. But I can see my thoughts as Icha Shakti, Jnana Shakti, Kriya Shakti. So to make it more objective, to be able to break it down, to see it as an ingredient rather than me thinking this. And so when I'm obsessed with something, this is just Icha Shakti working. <laughs> and when I feel this immense need to do, instead of just sit quietly and meditate, this is just Kriya Shakti working. The more we depersonalize it, the more that space gets created to lift ourselves out of the identification that at the moment is so strong and binding. Thvam shakti trayatmakaha. Thvam yogi no dhyayanti nityam. You are that which the yogis meditate on. The most, what's the word, sacred 
of things that we can do is meditate. And in order to meditate, we have to know what to meditate on. Otherwise, we will meditate, but we'll meditate on body, relationships, work commitments. Only when we understand the subtlety of what Brahman is, can we make our mind more and more and more subtle. And in order to do this, the next verse is described. So when learning how to chant, we were told you have to chant this whole line in one breath. Because chanting is related also to pranayamas. So shall we try? All together. We've been doing it for the last few days. Verse number eight. We chanted it yesterday, but we'll do it together today, just so to recap on what it is. One breath, okay? So you have to take a really deep breath in. Twam Brahma, Twam Vishnu, Twam Rudra, Twam Indra, Twam Magni, Twam Vayu, Twam Surya, Twam Chandrama, Twam Brahma, Burbu, Aswarom. Not so hard. <laughs> Here, all the devatas are being referred to. Vedic culture, Ishta Devata concept was not there. They worshipped or acknowledged and respected the devatas as they are the forces which influence and govern our lives. <coughs> but here, this is more a meditation technique. Tvam yogi no dhyayanti nityam. How do the yogis meditate on Brahman? We withdraw. So this is a similar trend that gets given in all Upanishads. In Katha Upanishad, it's mentioned quite elaborately. And then in the Gita, also, the sentiment is echoed. We identified with the most grossest layer of ourselves first, meaning the body. So we have to dissolve the body into the layer that's just before that. So if you think about it as the five sheets, Anamaya Kosha has to get dissolved into Prana and Maya Kosha. Prana Maya Kosha gets dissolved into Manamaya Kosha. Manamaya Kosha gets dissolved into Vigyana Maya Kosha. And that then gets dissolved into Ananda Maya Kosha. And then Ananda Maya Kosha has to also get dissolved into Brahman. Now, now, now that's too technical. How am I going to sit in my meditation seat and understand that? Okay. Senses. Because at the level of the body, that's what we're most fascinated and distracted with. The senses have to get dissolved into the mind. The mind has to get dissolved into the intellect. The intellect has to get dissolved into vasanas, vasanas into Brahman. Still too complicated. That's a very long process. Don't we have something a bit shorter? Yes, we have something a bit shorter. You can dissolve the different organs into their respective devatas. Huh? So, depends how well you have studied Tatwa Bodh. That's why I said the Upanishadic student has already done all the groundwork. The devata in charge of our hearing is, let's see who remembers Tatwa Bodh. No idea. Devata in charge of our seeing is fire. Oh, good, we remember that. <laughs> so here, every devata is being mentioned. <coughs> we'll just recap the different um, breakdown of the, what's given. We have five jnana indriyas, means five senses through which we get knowledge. Five karma indriya, the legs, the hands, the speech, the anus, and the reproductive organs. We have five pranas, and then we have four ways in which the mind works. Mana, buddhi, chit, ahankar. Now, not every single one <coughs> is being said here, but enough from all the different categories are said. So Brahma in charge of memory, Vishnu in charge of the ability to grasp, so the hands. <coughs> Rudra is ahankar. 
Indra is also related to mind. Which aspect? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Vayu is touch. Air is in charge of our sense of touch. Surya is fire in touch with um, in our sense of seeing. Chandra, moon, the mind. Overall, even before it is divided into the four portions. So a technique is given that we dissolve, so fire for speech, dissolve my speaking into the devata that's in charge of it. Maybe water might be an easier one to be able to understand. Water is connected with our taste. So if taste becomes a distraction to me in the seat of meditation, rather than think about what it is that I want to eat to create that taste, I turn my attention to the fact that taste is created by water. And so water exists as a principle within me, Varun Devata. And that water which is within me working as the principle to create taste, is the same as all the water all over the world. So now it becomes, there's water here, but it's the same as the water in all the dams and reservoirs, and it's the same as the water that's all in the ocean, it's the same as the water that exists in the clouds in the sky. And so now I've expanded from I want chocolate to Taste only exists because of water, Varun Devata. Varun Devata is not so small only to exist in my tongue to provide water, saliva. It's a force that exists that governs the entire universe. Now I'm no longer thinking about the chocolate. I'm now thinking about water principle, the dams, the oceans, the clouds. I've already grown in my awareness. They come back to... I can only exist when these principles are working. So we started with talking about ingredients. I am nothing but space, air, fire, water, earth. Then if I focus on how water works within me, taste, I dissolve that ability to taste into the devata or the cosmic principle, not a person, devata is not a person, it's a cosmic principle that allows that function to happen. So if I dissolve taste into water or varuna, it now no longer exists as an individuality that I am experiencing. So Twam, vish, twam Brahma, Twam Vishnu, Twam, that whole line is nothing but a way for me to practice in the seat of meditation, to dissolve each aspect that becomes a distraction into its source. We can go, we can go from senses to mind to intellect to vasanas to Brahma, or we can go from senses to universal principle. And each of these universal principles is nothing but manifestation of Brahman. And therefore the word Thwam. You'll notice in all these last verse and this verse, everything is Thwam. You are Shakti. You are the content of meditation. You are each of these devic ph the phenomenal forces and uh, the strength behind them. <coughs> so Slowly training ourselves to see what lies beyond what is apparent. Somebody who is very expert in computers, looking at the screen, already understands what's gone wrong in the coding process. They're seeing the effect, but from the effect can already see the cause. A doctor can see the symptoms and already understand 
what's gone wrong with in the biological process. A teacher sometimes, when a student makes a mistake, can see immediately, ah, because of this logic, the misunderstanding has happened and can correct it. So from seeing the effect, we train ourselves to be able to see the cause. In the seat of meditation, the things that will distract us is all our senses, our body, our thoughts. And so to see them, the effect of whatever it is that has come to distract me, to merge it back into the source. A technique on how the yogis meditated and when they were able to do this, can then revel in Brahman. And another technique is then given in verse number nine. Did we read nine? No? <coughs> we didn't repeat. follow up together. Yeah, repeat. <coughs> they can repeat. Ganadim Purva Mucharya. Ganadim. Varnadi instadanantaram Varnadi instadanantaram Anuswara parataraha Anuswara parataraha Harde indulasitam Harde indulasitam Tare naridam Tare naridam He tattava manuswarupam He tattava manuswarupam Gakara purva rupam Gakara purva rupam Akaro Madhyama Rupam Akaro Madhyama Rupam Anuswara Shantya Rupam Anuswara Shantya Rupam Binduruttara Rupam Binduruttara Rupam Nada Sandhanam Nada Sandhanam Sagum Hita Sandhi Sagum Hita Sandhi Another way to meditate is to focus on this monosyllabus OM. And even though it's just one syllable, it has been broken up here so elaborately. So if you read the English translation, or if you see a picture actually, do we have one in the book? On the top of the each page, they have. So they're talking about how to create the top curve, how to create the bottom curve, how to create the tail, how to create the crescent moon kind of shape thing, and then the dot on it. Since Vedic culture was not written, it was spoken, this is an explanation from the guru how to create the symbol of Om. And here, very much linked with the form of Ganesha. <coughs> Artistically, this has been done really well sometimes. I'm sure you've seen, right, how they incorporate the form of Ganesha into the, the Om. So when we draw this bit, the top loop, that's his face. And then Ganesha always has a really nice chubby belly. So the bottom loop has to protrude more and is even rounder and then goes up. Then the trunk comes out and then his eye is usually shown as a semicircle with a dot. And artists really have, if you Google, I'm sure you'll be able to see many, many pictures, have done a fantastic job in depicting this. So the Upanishad started with saying Om Namaste Ganapataya and equating the form of Lord Ganesha with Om itself. And so here in the showing of how to draw it creates the symbol. And what we use as the symbol of Om today is Ganesha. Not Om in the way that it's written in Sanskrit. To meditate on these different aspects. So the sound om we have been hearing very often is broken into three parts. A, um, ha. 
but it can also be described as broken into five parts because the lines that I used to create it and the initiation of the sound even before the sound comes as a uh, <coughs> and the nasalness with which how much you have to say it, all those specific details. And we need not go into it. Only to the extent of how much it's going to benefit us in our sadhana. To understand all the technicalities of it, only if that's going to be the sadhana we practice. Earlier when we were speaking on one of the verses, Guruji gave the breakdown of how speech works. Just trying to find that page number. Hmm. There were four types of speech. Anyone remembers where yeah. it was? 38. 38, thank you. Oh, my book is different. Maybe it's this one. Where does speech thirty six? Yes. Actually on thirty seven the last paragraph. <coughs> it talks first about the pranavani, the most subtlest form. But here when we're doing sadhanas associated with speech, we go from the most gross form. So the spoken word that actually comes out of our vocal cords is Vakrani Bani. Then we go into when we're just thinking it, Madhyamavani. Then when we're still formulating it within our minds, Pashyanavani. And then when it's even more vague, that there's no sound there exactly. We've just started the process of thinking and Paravani. And the step above that is called Nada Brahma. So to, not, if I'm not going to focus on the technicali technicalities of it, how silent is the mind? Even before I'm about to speak, how silent is my mind? In order for me to speak, sound has to be there first in my mind. If I don't speak in the sadhana of doing moan, so if um, no actual, the vocal cords don't get used. And even this happens in japa. When we do japa, the stages of japa is we chant it out aloud, right? Like even when we do collective prayer meetings, you all did Hanuman Chalisa a hundred times. And so you're chanting it out aloud, you're in a group. Sometimes when you're very tired, even though the group is chanting, you're doing it under your breath. So there's voice, but only you can hear that voice. And then when we very tuned in, the mind is in a beautiful sattvic space, we close our eyes and we're chanting along, but in our minds. There's still sound, and actually, vocal cords are still being used. We're just not aware of it because the mind is a lot stiller. And sometimes in that sattvic state, we stop chanting. Everyone else might be chanting around us, but we able to just be quiet. Even in that just being quiet while listening to other people chanting, sound is there. Not because it's outside and I'm listening to it, but inside, I've then reduced to focus on just the vibration of the sound because every sound has a vibration and an energy and a frequency. So if everybody collectively is chanting and then I just close my eyes and I feel I've become extremely still, I'm still focusing on just the vibration of that sound. If I become even more conscious and subtle, I tune in to the frequency of that sound that exists universally. So in space, all sound exists. 
and I'd be able to hear it if I tune into that frequency. This is referred to as Nada Brahma. And that's why music can be such a spiritual journey because sound has this capacity of making the mind so s subtle and because japa also works on the frequencies or in the basis of sound and even listening to satsang shruti vakya it's, it has to be spoken and so it's again the basis of sound and so sound is extremely sacred and auspicious okay so going back to this universal frequency the one that we tune into which will be there consistently and continuously is the vibration of Om. Now when we say Om through our vocal cords, it sounds the way we're saying it. But if we don't have vocal cords, what would it sound like? Very simply, if you block your ears. If you block both your ears, you will be able to hear something. Try it. Don't press too hard. Yes? Everyone could hear it? A more obvious one is when you listen to a conch. Most people will say you hear the sound of the ocean. Actually, it's not the ocean. Om, when we say it through our vocal cords, sounds like this. Take away our vocal cords. That's how it sounds. It's there all the time. We don't usually close our ears to see what sounds inside. But it's there all the time. When we talked about creation, sustenance, dissolution, in the beginning of creation, uh, and now, all through sustenance, and at the time of pralaya, it's there all the time. So to be able to tap into it and hear it without me putting my hands over my ears is then the most subtle form of meditating on sound. If it's there all the time, and if it's there everywhere, if I tune into it, Im already my mind becomes so much more pervasive. When I sit by myself and I chant, even that will extremely still help. <coughs> Even that helps me still my mind and is extremely effective. But if I'm able to hear it at even a more subtle level, then not only is the mind stilled, it expands. The more it expands, it's like a rubber band. If I really pull it, it never goes back to being as tight as it was. So those barriers of me believing I am this entity gets pulled. It gets looser. <coughs> and I do it often enough, it will snap. And I stay pervasive. So through the practice of any japa, any japa, we can do this. The most potent is all. The ones that Upanishads always talk about is Om. Because Om is Akanda. Akanda means full and complete. 
In the, ne in the very next verse, we're going to get introduced to another mantra well, after that. But first, we'll finish this. <coughs> or oh, actually, we'll do, we'll do that. So this description of Om is complete only when in verse number six, Twam, no, sorry, in verse number, when we give the mantra and how to, to um, draw it and to practice it, then he says, Seisha Ganesha Vidya, we haven't read it, we just read it. <laughs> Seisha Ganesha Vidya Seisha Ganesha Vidya Ganaka Rishihi Ganaka Rishihi Nichrit Gayatri Chandaha Nichrit Gayatri Chandaha Ganapatir Devata Ganapatir Devata These are more formalities. Whenever a mantra is given, we have to give due respect to the Rishi who the mantra was revealed to. And so here, yeah, Ganaka Rishihi the meter in which is chanted, because remember it was an oral tradition, the, tea, the guru was only speaking, it wasn't written down anywhere. <coughs> so to reinforce a point so nobody forgets it, this is the meter in which it has to be chanted, Nichat Gayatri Chandaha. And who is this, the mantra related to? Ganapati Devata. So this is ceremonious and formalities of whenever we talk about the mantra, we give due respect to all these different aspects. And then one more mantra is given. Om Ganganapataye Namaha Om Ganganapataye Namaha So whereas Om is a khanda and universal, in this mantra, it's very specific. Om is there, but then Gam. Gan is a bij mantra. Ganapataye is the a longer version of that same Bij Mantra, Namaha. Now, Bij Mantras are extremely powerful because Bij sounds are extremely potent. I think even in um, science, when you pack in a lot of energy to make it very, very small, or even how atomic um, um, nuclear power works, it's so small, but it's so incredibly potent. So beach mantras too, so much sound vibrations is collected in that one syllable. However, in beach mantras, they always one aspect of different energies. So if you look at ourselves, you'll say, you know, I'm, I can be very kind and understanding and patient, but if somebody pushes me too much, then they'll see my other side. I can be quite firm and I can be quite... So we have aspects of our sides. In terms of creation also, universal energies have aspects that Twam Brahmas, Twam Vishnus, Twam Rudras, Twam Indras. These are different aspects of phenomenal forces. Or values and virtues in of which we want to focus on. So Bij Mantras are not complete. They very concentrated doses of particular aspects. Whereas Om, Om is also a Bij mantra, but it's complete. It in, it in, it's inclusive of everything. So something like, if I want in the the, the we see this in Hinduism all the time. If I want to get better, then I go to Danvantri and I pray to him. If I want to get good marks in school, I go to Saraswati and I pray to her. If I want some particular obstacle removed in my life, I go to Ganesha and I pray to him. If I want to become more strong and, and be able to assert myself, Shiva. And then and so then if I want all of those, I'm running from one to the other. <laughs> Someone took me to that supermarket the other day where under one roof there was everything. There was clothes, there was <coughs> electrical equipment, the subjis, all of it. So Omi is like that supermarket where you get everything. 
in one stop. Not to bring down the sacredness of it, but in terms of we want. We want to have patience. We want to have courage. We want to have fearlessness. We want to have understanding. We want to have stillness of mind. We want to have healthy body. We want to have alertness of intellect. Om is inclusive of every other sound and therefore called akanda. And therefore Upanishads will say, meditate on Om. Also, when we want to achieve something, what we meditate on is what we are or what we become. Since we too want to be complete, it's the feeling of incompleteness that then generates so much desire and restlessness in us. So when we meditate on Om, which is complete, helps us to be able to find the completeness which is also already there within us. And so that whole description of Orm is given so that we create a symbol. And Ganesha himself can be the symbol or just that formation of Orm can be the symbol as a starting focal point. Remember, it's not about the form. The chanting of Orm and the sadhana of Orm is far more about the sound. And then becoming subtler and subtler in our ability to hear this sound more than my vocal cords, more than my thought, to tune into it on a cosmic level. And so two things happen. One, what I explained, my mind becomes more vast, the ability for me to loosen the grips of the boundaries that get created by the ahankar. <laughs> and it empowers. Remember, sound is energy, and so it's force, it's power. When I feel limited, I have only that much power which is inside. When I tune into universal concepts, I now have that much power. That power I don't use to do things in the world. That power I use to meditate and be able to free myself completely. To meditate and understand truth and be able to see it as clearly as how we see ourselves today. Today when we look in the mirror, we see so clearly, yes, me. And so to go from that, thinking this is me, to understanding, no, no, no. What's behind even that Nada Brahma, the cosmic sound that's there always, is silence. And that's me. That takes immense strength. And when I tune into the frequency of Om, which is so subtle, it gives me the strength to then go beyond even that, to truly abide in silence. And remember, the entire Upanishad has been saying, Twam. When I chant Om with my vocal cords, Twam, that's Brahman. When I chant Om in my mind, that's Brahman. When I'm able to hear the <coughs> vibration of Om as it exists all through the universe, that's Brahman. When even that sound dissolves, that's Brahman. There's nothing other than Brahman. And let's pause here. Let's spend the next few moments meditating on this Om and understanding or lifting our understanding as much as possible. 
to be able to hear it outside and then inside and then even deeper within. So we'll chant it very slowly together out aloud seven times. Hmm? Just Om. Long, nice, vibrant Oms. After seven times, Madhuji will chant it another seven times, but you'll chant it only in your mind. And then we'll just sit in silence for a moment or two. So seven times we are going to be doing it together. Seven times you're doing it in your mind. And then we're just sitting in silence. Take a deep breath in. Gently breathe out.
Ucchyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Gurubhyo Namaha Hari Hari Om. Sorry to break the silence with this announcement. We follow the tradition of Guru Dakshina. In the old days, people would take one sack of rice, one box of apples, whatever they could and they had in their home to share with the ashram and the Guru so that the ashram is sustained and therefore the imparting of this knowledge is sustained. Many of you are familiar with the tradition. You've received this envelope. Whatever you would like to contribute for the ongoing work, you can offer it at the altar tomorrow and we'll be giving a small prasad pushtaka. Thank you. Hare Krishna.